the Old Time Gospel Hour, Program 530, Regular Version. From the auditorium of the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, the Faith Partners and Friends present Jerry Falwell and the Old Time Gospel Hour. Thank you. Be seated. Joy to the world. That is not just a song for Christmas time. It should be sung about once a Sunday, 52 times a year. The Lord is come. I'm speaking today from Proverbs chapter 25 on how to deal with people, dealing with people. We have a world of 4.7 billion people. The only successful persons on this planet are those who have learned to, lo uh, to love and to relate to people. And that is our message for today from Proverbs chapter 25. We're also asking God to make for us the month of December, December 1 through 31. I want you to write that down for a prayer request. Put it on your prayer list that between December 1 and December 31, God will provide five million dollars in gifts from our friends everywhere, which will be matched and doubled, meaning ten million dollars, which will enable us during 1983 to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to every home in America, potentially, with 208 prime time programs per month, for 12 months, something that I doubt has ever been done in history, along with our regular network of programs. It's a faith project, a $10 million project. And everybody in this auditorium and all of our friends watching by television, I want you to ask God to help you to be a part of that miracle during that special month. And anything before December 31 will be doubled as we invest in gospel television for 1983. Don Norman and the Old Time Gospel Hour Choir come to sing for us a song that uh, tells how it was on this earth 2,000 years ago when Jesus came. There was no room for him. They had uh, room for everybody and everything but no room for Jesus, no room for Him. There are millions of people today in our world who have no room for Jesus, but one day, one day you will have that room, and I trust that you won't wait till eternity when it's too late, that you'll make room for Him now. But room for others 
and for other things. No room for Jesus in the world he made. No Youth Quest is a group of young people from the youth major at Liberty Baptist College. They're going to sing for us right now. While they're taking their place to sing for you, I would uh, remind all my friends all over America that with God's help, we are supporting President Reagan's effort, his constitutional amendment to return voluntary prayer to public schools in this country. And it appears that more than 90% of the American people are in favor of that particular amendment. That's a mandate. We're trying to find out how everybody feels on the subject. And if you feel that America's children should have the right to pray in the public schools of this country again, voluntarily, of course, if you feel that way, I would like for you to vote your convictions by calling our toll-free number. That toll-free number works throughout the continental United States, including Virginia, 1-800-446-5000. Just simply call and say, I'd like to vote my convictions on prayer in schools. And if you're for prayer in schools or you're against 
America's children having that religious liberty restored to them. We'd like for you to say so. And everyone who does, if you call today, we mail you this package, Kids Need to Pray. And inside, first of all, are two bumper stickers. And the bumper sticker simply says that kids need to pray. And on the side there, the books with the apple on top, it's, it's our way of saying we believe that prayer should be returned to public schools and children should have their religious liberty to pray again in schools. Two of those for your vehicles. And then my booklet, How to Get Your Prayers Answered, will ship both of these to you today. You'll have them in just several days at your home. No obligation. Our way of saying thank you for caring enough to vote. And we'll make your vote, your opinion known to the people who count. 1-800-446-5000. If you live in Hawaii or Alaska, the phone number won't work. Write to me, Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, and cast your vote. Gordon Luff, I want you to come up here real quickly, please. Gordon Luff, who started our youth ministry as it's now operated here at Thomas Road Church uh, many years ago, uh, now ministers in the state of Texas, which is a <coughs> subsidiary it's, uh, of Virginia. Uh, we, uh, we used to own it. We cut it off when we couldn't uh, underwrite it. But it, um, we are glad to have Gordon back with us today. He came in yesterday for a football game in which his son, Barry, did an outstanding job on the field, as did all the boys in winning their third straight game. And um, we congratulate them. But uh, Gordon, give us just a brief word on what's happening to you. Well, Lord, it's been good to us in Texas. We miss Virginia. And uh, just to be sure, I had the opportunity to keep coming back to visit it. I sent both my boys up here to college. And uh, you better do a good job with them. They need a lot of work. <laughs> uh, I kind of neglected them all the years I was on the road with kids like these guys. You started and, all these groups, you know. Yeah. And blame me <laughs> for all those F's and D's. And God's been good to us down in Texas. Uh, Dennis Henderson, who was on our staff here with us, and myself are trying to build a church in North Dallas. And my wife and I are ministering a Christian school. It has about 400 students in it now. And uh, the Lord's opened the door uh, this fall for us to uh, start a youth major again in a local college down in, in Dallas. And so God is expanding the ministry that was started here, and we appreciate the friendship and the prayers of so many friends here and appreciate the opportunity to send our boys to uh, the greatest Christian school in America. We appreciate everybody here and the leadership and long years of experience we gained here and are proud to be uh, really an extension, a part of this ministry, and Amen. friends with uh, the greatest Christian leader of our century. Thank you, Gordon. Let's welcome Gordon back to Lynchburg today. He brings us good luck. We won. And now, Bob, you trained under Gordon, didn't you? Bob Miller, who directs this group. This is Youth Quest. Just a word about the youth ministry. We have 141 of our graduates out in full-time youth ministry now in 39 states and six foreign countries. And uh, the youth majors represent 13% of our graduating class each year at Liberty. So we have a significant investment in youth ministry worldwide. And here's Youth Quest.
starts a seed to grow as gentle as September wind that causes leaves to blow as gentle as December snow that melts into rain so gentle was this Jesus when into this world he Thank you, young people. What is God's calling for my life? I'm often asked that question, and without hesitation, I can tell you it is to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to everyone in the whole world. That's the crowd for whom Jesus died, for God so loved the world. Here we are in 1982. We're looking very close now to 1983. How do we reach 4.7 billion souls? Well, there's no answer to that except through the use of the media. For 26 years, I have been on television talking to you and millions like you, and on radio as well, the full 26 years. Television and radio. And you know, the old-time gospel hour is now seen on nearly 400 television stations, one hour a week, uh, everywhere, and uh, you are one of those viewers who watches it. But did you know that the crowd, the real crowd that watches television, watches in prime time. You say, well, why isn't the old-time gospel hour in prime time? Two reasons. Number one, we can't buy prime time every week, one hour a week. It's not for sale from anybody, hardly. And secondly, if we could buy it, we couldn't afford it every week, 52 weeks a year in prime time. So we have to take what we can get and what we can afford. However, a door is open to us that I want to share with you, and that door is this. We have just concluded three or four months of prime time programming along with the network that we're on right now. And that prime time programming on what we call the Rose Garden Special Prayer in Schools and Inside the Cup has had a dramatic effect upon this nation. So we ask our agency to check with the stations all over America to see if they would sell us one prime time a month for 12 months in 1983. And if we could get a television station in every area of America so we would cover virtually every American home once a month in prime time for one hour, 12 times, January through December. Did you know we found out we can do it? We found out also it's going to cost about $10 million to do it. <laughs> you say, boy, that's a lot of money. It sure is. But I put this before the Lord, and I told you about it last week. Some dear friends have said, Jerry, we'll make a proposition to you. If you can raise $5 million during December for that project, that national media uh, blitz with the gospel across America, if you will seize onto that golden opportunity by appealing to your people, if they give $5 million, we will match it. A matching gift of $5 million providing by December 31, just days away, I've received $5 million from you. You say, I can't give $5 million. Could you give $5? That five will become 10. That's right. 
Could you give $10 for a national media blitz with the gospel in prime time television across America 12 times once a month in every home in America potentially? Then send $10. It becomes $20. It will be doubled. What about $25? That becomes $50. Some could give $100. That becomes $200. I am not suggesting what you should send. All I want you to do is pray, what will God have me to do to help Jerry Falwell preach the gospel in prime time? And there is about 10 times the audience in prime time as there is for the time slot in the Sunday morning period across the nation. 10 times the audience. Will you help me do it? The other side of the coin is if I don't reach the $5 million in matching gifts, I don't get the $5 million from my friends. It's all or nothing. If we get only $4 million, we don't get the $5 million in matching gifts. That's frightening, but it's a challenge. And I've always liked a challenge. And I think you like a challenge. I want you to write me a letter right now. Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia. How much you're going to put in the envelope? I don't know. Let God lead you. Make it payable to the old-time gospel hour and write on it for a matching gift. Whatever you write that check for, it will be doubled up to $5 million. And I've only got the days remaining in this month till December 31, midnight for the postmark, to reach that $5 million so it becomes $10 million. And we pay in advance. We pay in advance. Whether we give it to the stations or not, we have it in escrow to pay for the entire year uh, of uh, every major market in America once a month for 12 times. Nobody's ever done that before. Nobody. What a golden opportunity. A national media blitz with the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many people would be saved? I think several hundred thousand would come to know Christ if, if I could preach the gospel to them in prime time with 10 times the audience in many cases. Will you help me? Remember, whatever you write the check to and make it payable to the Old Time Gospel Hour. Those words are on the screen right now. The Old Time Gospel Hour. It's tax deductible. And whatever you write the check for, whether it's $5 or $10 or $25 or $50 or $100 or $1,000, double it. Don't you double it. It will be doubled here by others who are matching every gift we receive up to $5 million. If we don't make the goal, we lose the matching gift. So we, it's all or nothing. I've accepted the challenge. I'm taking my case to the people. I'm taking it to you. Will you help me? I don't care if you're sending a dollar or a hundred dollars. Send something. The Old Time Gospel Hour. Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, or Box 505, Richmond Hill, Ontario. But whether you're writing in the USA or Canada, do it now and help us go over the top. Just now and right before our message from Proverbs chapter 25, Mr. Mike Evans comes to sing. The splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny, was that lonely hill of Golgotha where he lay down. That is at last, and the ocean is dry. There are no clouds in the sky, and the sparrow can fly. If that is at last. of heaven knowing his destiny was
was this lonely hill at Golgotha, where God so loved this world, he gave his son there to die, that all that believe in him should never perish, but have wonderful, everlasting life. sky and the sparrow can fly if that is love then heaven's a me there's no feeling Proverbs chapter 25. Please open your Bible to the book of Proverbs chapter 25. We are teaching and preaching through the 31 chapters of the Proverbs these weeks. If you are a faith partner, that's page 1001 in the Faith Partner Study Bible. Let's all stand together as we, you listen and I read from Proverbs 25. These are also proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. The heaven for height and the earth for depth and the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from the silver and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. Take away the wicked from before the king and his throne shall be established in righteousness. Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king, and stand not in the place of great men. For better it is that it be said unto thee, Come up hither, than that thou shouldest be put lower in the presence of the prince, whom thine eyes have seen. Go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof, when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself, and discover not a secret to another, lest he that heareth it put thee to shame, and thine infamy turn not away. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver, as an earring of gold and as an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. As the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him, for he refresheth the soul of his masters. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. By long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. Hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be weary of thee, and so hate thee. A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul, and a sword, and a sharp arrow. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. As he that taketh away a garment in cold weather, and as vinegar upon nitre, so is he that singeth songs to an heavy heart. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman and in a wide house. As cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. A righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. It is not good to eat much honey, so for men to search their own glory 
is not glory. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Let us continue to stand as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this particular chapter that tells us how to deal with people. And help us, because we heard the word of God today, to be better channels of blessing to others and a source of pleasure to thee. We ask you now to speak to every heart for those who have never believed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection in our behalf. May this be the hour, the time of salvation. And may Christians recommit their lives to thee as they listen to the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. I am entitling Proverbs 25, Dealing with People. There's a key verse, it's verse 26. In the King James, it reads, A righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. One translator put it this way, A godly man who compromises with the wicked is like polluting a fountain or muddying a spring. And how true that is. Compromise for the child of God on spiritual matters does corrupt or muddy the spring. I believe that here in uh, Proverbs 25, we have some clear instruction on how to love and live with people. Now, every relationship that is important on this earth has to do with people. Of course, we have our vertical relationship with God, and God is a person, by the way. But we also have a horizontal relationship, and for every successful person in the world in any field, you have a person who knows how to relate with and to interact with people. Uh, being a hermit, a recluse, is a terrible thing. I can imagine that Howard Hughes was one of the most miserable men who ever lived. And he imposed that misery upon himself by isolating himself from people. I love people. I'm glad God called me to be a pastor. I, I speak to, I suppose, millions of people every week in person and through the media. And I speak to many thousands of people every week in person. I shake the hands of and speak to literally hundreds of people every week. When I go out in the banquets, if we have 1,500 people there, when the banquet is over, I shake 1,500 hands. I stay there until I'm the last person to leave. I enjoy meeting people. I don't put my top coat on and run for the back door during the final prayer. I enjoy meeting people. And here at this auditorium, the members of this church know that when the service is over, I'm right here to the last person leaves. And the reason for that is because I'm a pastor and God has given me a love for people. I would submit to you that in your work, whatever it is, if you don't love people, you're a failure. If you don't love being around people, communicating with people, relating to people, you're a failure. I know many pastors who can only make uh, a very short time, two or three years at the most in one place, because they haven't learned to love and get along with people, and usually they don't wear very well. In two or three years, they've worn out the welcome, and it's goodbye and off, led by the Lord to another ministry. And on and on and on. It's great to have a love affair with people and to be able to stay in the same place for all of your life and still have the same friends you had when you started and add a lot of new ones along the way. We have 19,000 members in this church. I can't honestly say I know everyone by name. There was a time when I did. Uh, but I can honestly tell you I love every one of them. And there's not a member of this church who I wish would move his letter. There's some here who might wish I would move mine, but there's not a person in this congregation that I am not glad you're a part of this church. And I think that in life, uh, Solomon is telling us that success is predicated upon the ability to love and get along with people. Now in verse 5, I have point one of my message for chapter 25. Advice to leaders. Do leaders have to get along with people? Look at verse 5. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne shall be established in righteousness. 
Now, that's just another way of saying, get all the crooked cronies away from the congressman and the president and the king and the leaders and the governors, and don't let them be insulated from the people by bad people. A good leader has good communications with the people whom he leads. He knows when they're hurting, and he cares. He's aware of where the people are, what they're thinking. You cannot be a good pastor, you uh, pastoral candidates. I call you preacher boys. You can't be a, a good pastor until you develop a spiritual perception of what is happening in the congregation. Are they happy? Are they sad? Is there unhappiness? Is there uh, discontent? Uh, is there a particular need among the people? Are they discouraged? What You've got to be able to spiritually feel what they feel. Now, that, for that reason, a good pastor will wrap good men around him who are a sounding board of what's going on in the congregation. You know, I've never objected to any of our staff or deacons or associate pastors coming to me and complaining about something. This is not a church where if you complain about something, whether it's the pastor or somebody else, that you find yourself on death row uh, shortly. You know, there are those ministries where the pastor or the leader thinks that he's God himself, and if you uh, challenge him or criticize him, uh, you've therefore committed a great sin. Leaders can be wrong too, and leaders need to know they can be wrong, and leaders need to be in touch with the people so that they can hear when they're wrong and do something about it. And that is what Solomon is saying here. Take away the cronies from before the king. We, uh, first, we're told in 1 Timothy 2 to pray for the president, the king, the one in authority, and for all those in government. Pray that God will give them wisdom, protect them, that God will speak to them. And if we pray for those who are over us, we also need to pray that God will give wisdom to the leaders to associate themselves with the right kind of people. A good leader can have bad people around him and fail. Not because his heart wasn't right, not because the leader had bad motives, but those around him would not allow anything to come through to him in correspondence or by word that they didn't agree with, they didn't believe in. Now, that isn't anything new to 1982. That's true with every leader who's ever been around. And may God help us. I, I thank God for the men who work with me. We have 71 associate pastors in this church. I thank God for all of them. And then we have four or five people who work very closely with me and, and almost on a daily basis. And none of them are afraid to tell me exactly what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. And for that reason, I'm able to stay in touch with and to, after 26 years, I can tell you this church has never had a split, a breakup, a church fight, or a church scrap, mainly, mainly because we know when the little problem is beginning to develop and we know the scriptural principles of going to people and praying with people and working out problems, and when wrong has been committed, getting those things righted, all of that is the healing process that Solomon is talking about here. Secondly, this one is verses 8 9 and 10, getting along with your neighbors. Now, some of you are saying, boy, he hasn't preached to me yet because I'm not the president, I'm not a member of Congress, I'm not the governor, I'm not the mayor, I'm not a city councilman. Okay, now we get down to you. Go not forth hastily to strive, meaning don't, don't run to court very quickly to sue your brother, lest thou know not what to do in the end there when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame, Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself. Go to him privately and discover or reveal not a secret to another. Don't talk to everybody about the problem between the two of you. Lest he that heareth it put thee to shame, and thine infamy turn not away. Now these are verses 8 through 10. Getting along with your neighbors. You say, I don't have many neighbors. Well, geographically, of course, Solomon's talking about the house next to you on both sides and across the street and behind you. He's also talking about those neighbors with whom you work or with whom you attend school or with whom uh, you play or with whom you observe leisure time, whatever. He is talking about the people with whom you come in contact every day, your neighbors. How do you get along with your neighbors? Well, first of all, when your neighbor wrongs you, whether verbally or in action, don't run to the outside to a courtroom or to the public 
to say, oh, so-and-so did this to me. He was dirty. She was cruel and so forth. Go to the person. And Solomon says, go quietly. Don't discuss it with other friends. And uh, share that with that neighbor. And try to debate the cause and correct the problem so that you will not be brought into shame because of your misbehavior. You know, there's a great deal today uh, going on in the area of lawsuits between believers. Now, the Scriptures in the book of Corinthians are very clear. If my brother wrongs me and even costs me some money, I have no right to take him to court. That's what Paul says, don't take your brother to law. Well, I'll lose the money. Far better to lose the money than violate the Scripture. Lose your testimony. Down through the years, people here know that uh, we in the ministry will not sue a brother in Christ. We get sued by brothers all the time, but, and others, some who don't claim to be brothers, but we, get, we get, but we don't sue brothers because the Bible is very clear on the subject and because some people know that if they do us in or hurt us or, or financially wrong us that we won't take them to court, some people do take advantage of us. But may I say to you that God makes it up so many ways. When you follow the scriptural plan, God makes it up to you. You may lose $1,000 here, but God will make it up with 2000 over yonder because you did the right thing. I hope that Christians all over this nation and other nations who are listening to me right now will realize that the Bible has the plan, the prescription, uh, to correct problems between brethren. Clearly, it's to go to your brother, confess your fault, Try to bring about a reconciliation. If he won't hear you, that's his problem. But you have cleared your conscience with God. And if he's wronged you financially and he won't be honest about it, pray for him. Ask God to speak to him. But don't take him to court. When you have the advantage on somebody and take it, God always sees to it that somewhere somebody gets the advantage on you. And God sees to it that they put their foot right on your neck to teach you the lesson that that isn't the way it's supposed to be done. The rule is to do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Don't do unto others before they do unto you. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's biblical, and that is what Solomon says, here's our relationship toward our neighbors. Now, point three, verses 16 and 28, how to deal with yourself. You know, I don't have as near as much problem with politicians and neighbors as I do with me. Now, I don't know if you have that problem or not, but the number one problem I have is the fellow I shave every morning. And if I understand the Bible, that's about the way it is with all of us. There's a war going on constantly, Romans chapter 7, within us between the flesh and the spirit. The spirit wants to do what is right. The flesh wants to do what is wrong. And daily as we feed upon the Word of God and pray, if we look to God, we can have the victory. Christ can be Lord, and we can overrule the flesh and the power of His name. Notice verse 16. Hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. You know what that means? When people start saying nice things about you and pouring that sweet, wonderful praise on you, don't swallow too much of it. It'll make you nauseous. As a matter of fact, it'll nauseate the people around you. There just isn't anybody I'd uh, rather not be around more so than the person who doesn't listen to anything you're trying to say. And all the time that you are saying something, he isn't listening to what you're saying. He's trying to think of how to top you, how he'll beat that one. And it's I this and I that and I did this and I accomplished that. Solomon said, hey, have you found some honey? Have people been kind to you and promoted you a little bit and pumped you up a little? Don't you believe that stuff? In today's world, it simply means don't believe your own press releases. To the politician, to the preacher, don't you believe what people tell you when they're shaking hands with you about how great you are. You're not. You're just as sorry as you always thought you were. But, you know, it's nice for them to say those things, but you're nothing but a sinner saved by the grace of God. And it's very important you understand. Look at verse 28. 
He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Lack of self-control. Intemperate. No control over the flesh. No control over your habits. No control over your attitudes and actions. The places you go. The things you do. Here we have it. Verses 16 and 28. Watch out for that ego. Uh, I thank God for my wife and three children. And, and, and you would not think as much of me if I didn't say that I think I have the most wonderful wife in the world, the most wonderful children in the world. But I would likewise think there was something wrong with you if you agreed with me. You'd better think your wife and your children are the best. Now that's not egotistical. That's, that's just the love that's in a home, in a family. But may I say to you that it's possible to take those things a little too far. You know, I have three children. They're very normal. Uh, they do all the things that other children do and shouldn't do. Jerry is 20 and he's a junior in college. Uh, Jeannie is uh, 17 and, and uh, she's a first year student at Liberty Baptist College. Uh, Jonathan is just now 16 and he's a junior in high school. And uh, I can tell you that they, they, they have multi-talents in many ways. At the same time, they have all the problems and difficulties that all other young people have. And I never expect them to be a preacher's kid. I just expect them to be Christian kids. I don't want them to be anything your kids are not. I don't put any pressure on them uh, to be anything that your children are not pressured to be. I don't want them to ever grow up resenting the fact that they grew up in church and were uh, the children of a pastor. I want them to be normal and natural. But it's very bad when a daddy gets to thinking that his kids are the only ones around. They can do this. They can do this. I have actually seen fathers ruin their children by painting a non-existent picture of their greatness, their talents, their abilities before the world, then the kids try to live up to it and can't and fail and in frustration don't make it. That happens all the time in the Christian community. Don't let it happen to yours. Promote your children, encourage them, but don't set goals so high for them or paint pictures so beautiful about them that they cannot attain to it because all you do is frustrate them and drive them down. That's ego. What you're really doing is saying, look what a great daddy I am. Look what a great mother I am. The reason the kids are so great, they came from us. And nobody believes that but you when you're telling it. So just don't make a fool of yourself. And that is what Solomon is, is saying here. Have you found some honey? Don't eat too much of it. Because nobody believes it but you if you believe it. They all know you. Now, they knew you before you had the, not the, the letters behind your name. That PhD, you know, is just like the little curl on the pig's tail. The, the ham doesn't taste any better. Dr. Towns didn't look up then, but he has two or three of those. But it's, um, it doesn't make the meat taste any better. It's just, it's nice and all, but uh, the world knows us all for what we are, sinners saved by the grace of God. And there are su no super talents in this room. I know all of you just like you know me. We just happen to be used of God, that's all. Each of us have some different abilities we can use, but none of us is special. None of us. And that's true with everybody else. The reason Hollywood is such a disaster, it's a fantasy world. They're trying to be unreal people. The tragedy is they're very real. And many of them very really wrong in their lifestyle and their way of life and so on. Finally, verse 21 and verse 22 how to deal with your enemies. Do you have any enemies? Anybody who doesn't like you? I doubt it. But here it is. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. I can honestly tell you that when I hear from time to time of some critic of mine or person who doesn't like me experiencing misfortune, I feel remorse, not joy. I am sorry. I hope I'll always be able to say that. I hope I will never become in later years a bitter old man who is glad when his critics fail or his enemies have misfortune. You see, all of us are going to die one day. Nobody knows who's going to die first, but we're all going to die. So it's so dumb to be rejoicing in some, even if it's your enemy, who's having a hard time. Because there'll come the day when the doctor walks in your room and says, I hate to tell you this, but this is what you have. 
And then all that other stuff doesn't amount to anything. I have a friend of mine who's worth scores of millions of dollars. He has an incurable disease and a very short time to live. How much do you think his money means to him? You know, when they come in and talk to him about this deal that's going on, it doesn't excite him. He knows in a few months he won't be here. What does he care about the money? What does he care about the business? And we need to look at all of life from that perspective. We are dying men, every one of us. And the important thing in this world is not stepping on other people and retaliating against our enemies and hurting people uh, when they're down. The important thing is to so live for Christ down here that when we are gone, we have left a trail of good works behind us so that as the Scripture says, it, uh, being dead, we yet live. We are a blessing to people with whom we have met, and our good works behind us continue to bless people and bring pleasure to God. That's the ultimate goal for every man on this earth. You have some critics, some enemies. Of course we do. You know, I, the, 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 the finest line that I walk as a Christian is this. As a child of God, the love of God is shed abroad in my heart, which means it's impossible to hate anybody. A Christian can't hate anybody, period. That's the way it is. The other side is, as a Bible preacher, I must stand up, not only preaching the gospel of Christ and winning men to, to the Savior, but lifting the biblical standard of righteousness. That means we must stand up against what is wrong in our generation. And for somehow, for some reason, there are so many in this world who do not understand how you can be against sin while loving sinners. They don't understand how you can hate alcoholism and drunkenness, but love drunkards. How that you can hate homosexuality and love homosexuals. We had a debate on Donahue on that very subject, and someone in the audience said, you can't love somebody and hate what they do. That's conditional love. I asked her the question, do you love thieves? Of course I do. Do you love stealing? Of course not. All we're saying is you can hate sin and love sinners. And we've got to walk that line. We cannot have contempt against anybody. We can't be bitter against, hateful towards anybody, no matter what they're doing. But at the same time, we cannot lower the flag for the sake of togetherness and forget that there is a biblical standard of right and wrong, and it's given to us in this book right here, the Bible, the wonderful Word of God. Now, the question I'd ask you today is how, how are you getting along with people? Our message is entitled Dealing with People, from Proverbs 25. We've talked about uh, advice to leaders. Leaders need to get along with people too, verse 5. We've talked about getting along or dealing with our neighbors, verses 8 through 10. We've talked about dealing with ourselves, dealing with yourself, uh, verses 16 and 28. We've talked about dealing with your enemies. Verses 21 and 22. How are you getting along with your leaders, with government? How are you getting along with your neighbors, yourself, your enemies? And of course, the most important question of all, how are you getting along with the Lord? 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, the perfect God-man, perfect God, perfect man, died upon a cross between two thieves, shed his blood as the payment for all of my sins and yours forever. And today is at the right hand of the Father, having resurrected from the grave and ascended to the right hand to come back one day to take us unto himself. And the question is, has there been a time and a place in your life when you have trusted Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, invited him into your heart? If not, then you ought to do it today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. How many of you will say, Jerry, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I know it. There was a time and a place when I invited Jesus into my heart. And if I die today, I'm as sure for heaven as if I were already there. I'm saved and I know it. Would you raise your hand high, please? God bless every one of you. If you couldn't lift your hand for one reason or another, with every head bowed, right now I want to pray for you. If you're not a Christian, if you're not sure you're saved, I want to pray that you will come to know Christ before it's too late. If as a child of God you need to repent of sin and rededicate your life, I want you to do it today. With our heads bowed right now, there in the pew, if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, there by the television set, just bow your head right now and pray this prayer from your heart. Oh God, I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. But I believe Jesus died for me 
was buried for me, rose from the dead for me. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and save my soul. Amen. While our heads are still bowed. How many across this auditorium will say, Jerry, pray for me? Raise your hand. Just slip it up right now. Pray for me. I have a need. God knows what it is. God bless every one of you. In a few moments, we'll invite you to walk down these aisles, and our pastors will go with you to a prayer room and help you. There by the television set, if you'll write me of your decision for Christ today, I'll send you the same literature we give these who walk the aisles. My booklet, How to Get Started Right. If you still have a request about uh, your salvation, you're not sure about it, uh, then give me your telephone number. We'll call you at our expense, and we'll help you. If you need prayer, write me. We have uh, people to pray for you by name, by need. I'll write you personally. We have someone to counsel with you on the prayer hotline 24 hours a day. If you're deaf, there's a free TTY line for you. Let's stand, please, to pray. Father, help men, women, boys and girls right now to do what they'll be glad they've done when standing in your presence one day. For Jesus' sake, I make this prayer. Amen. While our heads are still bowed and eyes are still closed, I'm going to ask every man, woman, boy, girl in this building with a spiritual need, upstairs and down, I ask you to come down to these pastors, go to a private prayer room, and there one of them will pray with you and help you. If you need to get right with God, you need to get saved, you got a family problem, you want family counseling, it's all here waiting for you. No charge. Just come. If you want to join our church today, we invite you into our fellowship. Come on while we sing. Thank you for watching this Old Time Gospel Hour program. If you would like to help us take the gospel to America through prime time television, then make a check payable to the Old Time Gospel Hour and send your gift to Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, 24514. In Canada, write to Jerry Falwell, Box 505, Richmond Hill, Ontario. During this month of December, any gift you make to this ministry will be matched dollar for dollar from a special matching gifts fund. So please give generously and help us reach our goal to make this the greatest soul-winning campaign in history. Now, this is John Corrigan. May God richly bless you is our prayer. This has been a presentation of the Liberty Broadcasting System.